Hey guys, Luke here at the eDrum Workshop, a new channel for people who want to get the most out of their electronic and hybrid drums. This is the first video that I shot for this channel. Uh, I shot it a while ago because uh, I just wanted to get something down. I'd been mulling the idea over for quite some time. It's a bit of a deep dive into the topic of that relationship between what you hear and what you feel when you're playing on your eDrum kit. I'm not going to lie, it doesn't look the best. There's probably going to be a few videos like this to begin with uh, while I'm working out the kinks and trying trying to get things uh, to feel natural for myself. Hopefully there's enough useful information in there for people to, uh, to take what they need and uh, still get some enjoyment out of it. So let's get to it. A huge part of the satisfaction of playing your eardrums doesn't actually come from the sounds alone. Yes, it's great when your kit sounds amazing through headphones or through speakers, but sometimes the sounds aren't the only thing that are making it feel real to you when you play. This is where what I like to call the play feel comes into it. Since drum modules have to process the strike of your hit before sending out an appropriate sound, that feeling can be quite different to playing an acoustic drum. You don't get the same feeling of air movement, you don't get the immediacy of a sound source throwing sound directly back to you after you've hit it, and sometimes those nuances that can be achieved with an acoustic instrument that changes depending on where you hit it, how you hit it, what you hit it with, can be lost as part of the eardrum experience. Hopefully, I'm gonna be able to shed some light on the phenomena for anybody that might have been left feeling unfulfilled while playing eardrums, or even if it's just to help explain why your kit might feel amazing to you but not to somebody else, or vice versa. I've owned a few of the Roland drum modules. I started on a TD3 years ago and then I upgraded to a TD15 and now finally I own a TD50. From the modules that I've owned alone, I feel like I've had a pretty good spread of Roland's different sounds across the generations. I think the most notable things that people say most often about Roland sounds is that they're quite synthetic and fake sounding. I do mostly agree with that to be fair, but I think that there's one caveat and that is that the sounds do cut well through a mix, especially in a live scenario. But one thing that I've noticed with Roland's drums, and I think is part of the reason they're still picked over other modules by many people, is that the play feel has been kind of mastered. The sounds are up front, they're full of attack, and they're responsive. On modules that have positional sensing, the responsiveness is heightened as you move across the drum head. The sounds often feel like they react to what you play, even if there's not thousands of amazingly sampled layers. Sometimes this can be more important for realism. Your snare might not sound exactly like an acoustic snare, but if it plays similarly to one, with a fuller tone towards the centre, and thinner and more ringing tones towards the edges, it can be convincing enough to enjoy playing it as its own instrument. Another thing that can come into it when up against acoustic sounds is that sometimes those process sounds sound closer to what you want your drums to actually sound like than a true acoustic representation of a real drum kit in a room, especially in a mix when playing to recorded music. Not having to fight against an acoustic drum just to get that sound that you want to hear can be really satisfying if what's coming through your headphones is exactly the representation of a drum kit that you want. Whether it be a big, thick, reverb-covered snare or whether it be a little tight, poppy snare drum that has very little ring or very little snare wire, you can make those sounds happen and get it to sound closer to what you're hearing on a record than you would do in a room with a drum kit. So having those sounds that you want with that immediacy that Roland sound characteristics give you can do wonders for the play feel. And the sounds are heavily customizable, so you can take a half decent sound but edit it into a much more enjoyable one with compression, EQ, tuning and all that stuff. Roland have done a pretty good job of making their sounds flexible but without the same kind of warping that you might get when you're trying to tune an acoustic sample. And again, that can work in their favour for the playing experience. It's not necessarily for everybody, but to me, it usually feels quite satisfying to play even if the sounds aren't perfect. I owned an ATV AD5 drum module for about a year, but unfortunately for me I had quite a negative play feel experience with it. This totally won't be true for everyone, lots of people absolutely love the AD5 module and I can actually understand why, but personally it wasn't for me. ATV sounds are very acoustic-like, they're raw, they're unprocessed, they seem to be very close-miked without any room sound or ambience. 
You don't have any options to tweak these sounds in the module. You can't tune them. You can't add reverb to them. You can't compress them. You can pretty much only change the volumes in relation to each other. And that's about it. For some people, this is exactly what they're looking for. A module that doesn't require you to sculpt sounds. It just gives you dry acoustic sounds that sound like you're sat behind a drum kit in quite a small room. Personally, I felt a lack of connection to the sounds, especially the snare drum sounds. I bought quite a few additional sounds from the ATV sound store. I'd listen to them and I'd be like, wow, that snare sounds amazing. So I'd purchase it, I'd put it in my module and then I'd start playing and I'd be left scratching my head. The sounds just never really felt the same while playing as they did when I listened back to them. I would record myself playing it, feel like it sounded a bit rubbish, listen back through my studio monitors and then wonder why it sounded so great on the recording. I even had a depth drummer filling in for me on a show and I, uh, I lent her the drum module because my band are actually one of the few that prefer a quieter stage volume. I sat in on the rehearsal and I was like, wow, this sounds like an, an acoustic drum kit. But it just didn't seem to matter what I did, I could never feel that sound while I was playing it. It was really frustrating. For me, the play field just never lined up with the sounds that were on board the module and I'm going to take my best stab at explaining why that might be. So first off, I think I uh, always felt like there was no direct immediacy of the sound while I was playing. I think it's something to do with the attack. It always felt sort of late to me. And I think that what I was obviously expecting that to feel like versus what was coming through my headphones clearly wasn't lining up. It just sort of uh, never quite felt like it was translating what my hands were doing properly. Part of that will have come down to the uh, trigger response too. I could never really dial my pads in properly with the parameters that were available on the AD5. I feel like the setup wizard's really, really good. If you've got the right pads, I could set up my roll and symbols really easily uh, with the trigger wizard and I thought that was incredible. But all of my DIY pads that you need to mess about with a bit more on roller modules, I just couldn't get them working properly at all. And I think that relationship between how you play and then what you're hearing coming out and, and you know what the module's doing is it is another huge part of the play feel experience. There's also a few sounds in the module that I think are actually sort of straight up recorded badly. Some of the stock snares actually choke at the higher velocities. Some of the hi-hat samples um, went all the way up to being so wide apart that they weren't touching each other, which uh, is never a sound that I would go for on an acoustic kit. I feel like if there were enough settings available to be able to tweak that out with the parameters then it really wouldn't be an issue and for some people maybe they might use it but it being a sort of default part of the sound did not work for me. A few of the uh, Tom samples had a weird metallic sort of attack which I always felt like it shouldn't have been there. There was uh, some quite heavy pitch bending too on a couple of the Tom samples but it wasn't consistent in the Tom sets necessarily so it didn't sound like it was deliberate. Again, if you if you like that sound and that's kind of what you go for on an acoustic kit, then great, but uh, it wasn't for me. And if it isn't for you, then that makes that sound completely a write-off because you don't have any options to change it. So uh, this meant that I was limited to only a s smaller selection of sounds. The, uh, the main snare that I actually quite liked did that choking uh, thing on the uh, the top velocity layer so what I actually ended up doing was changing my trigger setting so that I could never actually trigger the highest velocity on my snare which it worked out okay but it kind of it reduces your dynamic range a bit which uh, you know when there's only so much scope to do that anyway it was just another weird limiting factor that I just couldn't get on with. Now to its credit the AD5's cymbal sounds I think are pretty incredible. The, uh, the hi-hat thing I managed to get around by purchasing a couple of sounds from the ATV store that didn't have that same issue. And just all the crashes and the rides, I always thought that they sounded great. I guess because they've got enough sort of natural decay in the samples anyway, you didn't really need loads of room sound. So yeah, they always played really well as well. So I, I felt that, you know, I almost felt strongly enough about the symbols that I was thinking about keeping that module just to use the symbols rooted through my TD50, which... It's kind of nuts really, which is why I didn't end up doing it, but um, they did sound that good and I and, and they played well too, so I, I, I enjoyed using them. One thing that I did try doing, which actually helped me somewhat work out what the issue was for me, 
was that I, I routed the master routes through the audio inputs on the SPDSX and uh, and I used the master effects on the import to try out playing the AD5 with things like a bit of reverb or a bit of compression on them. And uh, what I found really was that that actually brought the AD5 sounds a bit more in line with what I was kind of expecting to hear, I guess. So yeah, basically it, it amounted a bit to uh, too much messing around and uh, not enough flexibility for me to actually be able to use that in practice. It did help me identify what it was about the characteristics of the AD5 that I didn't particularly like and it also helped me work out what it is that I clearly expect to hear from a drum module and that was quite important to me and was also part of what sort of inspired this video to be honest. And I think one of the important things it highlights is uh, the need to sort of sit down and play a drum module in order to work out whether it sounds good for you and whether it plays well for you and if it feels right. Because we've all watched those drum tech videos with, uh, you know, Ralph playing an AD5 module like a boss and you go, wow, this module sounds amazing, but you might not get that experience out of it when you sit down and play it. Or any other module, not necessarily just the AD5, that was only my experience. I've had the Mimic Pro for a couple of months now and it's actually replaced my TD50 as my, uh, as my live module. So clearly I'm a fan. The Mimic's approach to sound is sort of what lots of people have been, uh, have been asking for really for a long time. Almost perfectly sampled drum sounds taken from Stephen Slate 5 uh, that are acoustic but clean sounding with, uh, with microphones all over the place. The ability to tweak the mix on a pretty insanely fine level. You can process them with EQ and compression on practically every microphone. There's a, a master EQ and compression. There's a few extra tweaking options available to enhance the feel. Uh, you know, you, you can tune the pitches up and down, you can edit the attack and the sustain and the release, but it's uh, not on the same level as like Roland's sort of tweak everything sort of approach, you know. For me, the Mimic pretty much offers the perfect sort of uh, balance between the, the sounds and the, and the play feel. The sounds for me uh, have that immediacy and that attack that, uh, that I like about Roland sounds. Uh, and you can and you can tweak that specifically quite easily with the direct microphone uh, levels and the and the room mic levels. So really, it offers just enough flexibility to sort of typically cater for for people who like dry sounds and and people who like much more wet, roomier sounds. And I feel like there's enough flexibility in the EQ and the compression and the trigger parameters uh, to sort of bring that play field to the next level. One thing that I've, uh, that I've noticed about the Stephen Slate sounds uh, that really seems to exemplify what I mean about the particular sounds and then the play feel of a module is uh, the, the Stephen Slate 4 sounds. In my opinion, they don't seem to be recorded as well. I think if you listen to them in isolation, they sound really good on their own, everything's fine, but when you then A-B them with the Stephen Slate 5 sounds, it's almost sort of jarringly apparent, I think, that there's a different approach to recording happened between the two different packs and it uh, feels like they don't particularly mesh together very well. In particular, I feel like the ghost notes um, in the Stephen Slate 4 drums don't respond naturally at all. To me, they just sort of sound like full velocity strikes just turned down on the volume fader. So the difference in what I'm expecting a ghost note just to sound like versus the ghost note sound that's coming out of the module were so at odds with each other that it completely ruins the immersion of playing on an electronic kit. And I think that if those were the only sounds that were really available inside the Mimic, then it would have been a lot more disappointing to me. So it just goes to show that it's not always down to one particular manufacturer, it can just be the sounds that are in the library that, uh, that make all the difference. The physical relationship between the actual object you're hitting uh, and you and the sound that you're hearing is obviously going to be another large factor in the play feel. Most people have sort of settled nowadays on mesh heads being one of the better surfaces for drums, but some people still swear by Yamaha silicon pads. Some people really can't stand rubber E symbols and they're, you know, they're always searching for the best A to E style conversion symbol so that what they're hitting feels more like its acoustic counterpart. And I think that how solid something is when you hit it versus how solid 
the real acoustic thing would be when you hit it is a pretty important part of the equation. I've noticed that when I'm playing on sort of spongier mesh heads like uh, a Remo single ply one or the uh, Z heads, that tends to take me quite out of the zone. I'm hearing the solid crack of a snare drum and I'm expecting it to feel like an acoustic head. So if my stick starts sinking into it, it's going to completely mess up that feeling. I, uh, I recently bought an 18 inch ATV ride um, it flexes much more like a real cymbal and I've noticed that makes a huge difference for me while I'm playing. So having nice playing surfaces is going to sell that uh, organic relationship between you hitting a pad and what you're hearing. Hiya. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to briefly expand on the uh, the trigger setting stuff that I touched upon in the uh, AD5 section. This has a massive impact on the feel of a kit and I feel like the more options that are available to you the better. Roland triggering tends to be great out of the box with their own pads and I think that's another quite big contributing factor as to why they have such a dominance over, over the market. Their trigger settings are pretty in depth as well so you tend to have the ability to tweak even the most awkward pads to make them work properly on their modules. There are of course a few exceptions, some Yamaha pads just won't play properly at all on a Roland module or you have to mess about with them and you only get two zones instead of three, things like that. But for the most part you can make the bulk of pads work okay on roller modules. The Mimic Pro's triggering is really tweakable, you can change almost everything on a very granular level. You can draw in velocity curves which has helped me no end with DIY pads. This helps you match up your playstyle to the way that the triggers are responding. You can also do the same with the high uh, open close curve which I again find incredibly useful. You can set your upper and lower velocities really easily. You can really fine tweak exactly when a rim shot comes in and certain tweaking options effectively remove upper or lower sample layers which again if you don't particularly like the sound of a velocity layer you can kind of tweak it out. So it was kind of that combination of triggering and then the sound shaping that swayed it for me with the Mimic. As I touched on I could never really get the AD5 to quite do exactly what I needed to and I felt like a limiting factor of this was the number of trigger options that are available. I think that's what really stuck the boot in for me uh, after being decided disappointed with the sounds was that I couldn't get them to do exactly what I wanted anyway. So uh, wow that was a, lo a long video. Thanks for sticking around. As you can see, the time of day has blatantly changed since I started recording this video. May as well just quickly sum up with some final thoughts. Having a satisfying play feel I think is basically the, the biggest obstacle for people trying to get into e-drums and I think that bad play feel is maybe actually worse than less than stellar sounds. I think that somehow Roland managed to make their sounds work for the way that their trigger response works even if the sounds can be underwhelming at times. I think that the AD5 and the Mimic they go the opposite way. They provide you with much more acoustic like sounds but their approaches are very different to each other and what leads to a good play feel for you is going to very much depend on whether or not your expectations line up well with their approach. I'm hoping that this might have helped shed some light on the issue. Thanks for watching. I've got other videos lined up such as whether or not you should use your eDrums live and if you choose to do so, how you can optimize them. So if that sounds interesting to you or you've taken something away from this video, uh, feel free to subscribe because there's going to be plenty more content like that available soon. And yeah, thanks very much. Cheers.